For those that have seen me present before, you'll probably know I end up talking about nothing about what was written on the title or the blurb. Um, so hopefully you're in for something interesting today. And I think with the, the superhero theme for today, I think an interesting thing about superheroes is when they come into their superpowers, it always happened at a moment when they weren't expecting it or weren't really like needing it to happen or an awkward moment. And for that reason, the title of this talk today and the blurb we deliberately made as boring as possible so that the people in this room are actually going to get their superpowers today. Like, this is the moment um, that you're going to come into your revelation and you're actually going to have such an extreme advantage over everyone else in the main stage and you're going to carry that superpower with you for the rest, rest of your careers. So, so get ready for this. In 2013, there's a really interesting piece of research done by Harvard uh, by a lady called Caitlin. And surprisingly, it looked at this really messy link between the slave trade and how modern business management performs today. And I'll give you a couple examples. So in the South, uh, like Jamaica, etc., they had the cotton trade and they would have this really fortunate situation in the slave trade where they had really low turnover unless people died. And because of that, even though the slave trade is, is such a bad thing, because of that they started experimenting with a lot of kind of management KPIs and SLAs and things like that because no one was really able to leave the workforce. And so they started doing these things which were horrible, like they would uh, have a, a bonus food incentive for people that could pick the most cotton in a day and then the winner would get more food, but then that would become the new benchmark with which everyone else would have to pick that cotton for every day for the rest of their lives. And if they didn't meet that target, then they would reduce their food count. They would also have when women would uh, go into labour and have a child, um, the faster that they could get back um, into labour, uh, into slave labour, again, they'd be rewarded with more food, but that would become the new benchmark with which every other female had to get back into the workforce on. The situation in the North was very different. So it was a normal workforce in the North. And if they started implementing these KPIs and SLAs, the workforce would just quit. And so the evolution, what this Caitlin discovered, was the evolution of KPIs and service level agreements and benchmarks and things like that actually evolved from the slave trade not from um, the general workforce. And if you think about, like fast forward to today, who would you say is more productive? South America, from an economic perspective, South America or North America? Hands up if you think North America is more economically productive than South America. <laughs> okay, so it's pretty obvious, like, that the way we treat our labor uh, and our workforce and the way we treat our candidates um, really impacts the long-term productivity and this is a study that like has been groundbreaking for Harvard in terms of looking at um, you know the way they look at business management in the future and it's really um, impactful for the way that we need to think about you know how we want to set like KPIs and SLAs and all that sort of thing with our workforces uh, moving forward. I'm going to digress for a second and you'll realise what I'm harping on about like towards the end of this speech. <coughs> this is Umedia. So for those that don't know Umedia that well, uh, the biggest outdoor uh, media company in Australia, every billboard you walk past, everything you see at the airport is pretty much Umedia. This is their social media following. So Umedia have been doing social media uh, you know, for about six to eight years with, with a solid amount of effort. They've got six, 2,600 Instagram followers. 8,500 Facebook followers, 19,000 LinkedIn followers. <coughs> Two years ago, they launched a talent community. Within two years, they got 24,200 followers. The run rate of their talent community means within three to six months, they're gonna have more people following their recruitment side of the business than, than the entire sales and marketing team put together. Now for Umedia this is a really good thing because they understand a lot of these people that are applying to them are customers as well. They're people that will go on to work in other businesses and be advocates for that business or they might even be buyers of Umedia's marketing material. 
So to them, this is a huge positive. But for a lot of organizations, this is actually a massive negative. And the reason being is that if your Google job applications are, this is what Google will return as the three top responses of what it thinks you're going to finish that sentence as. And that is job applications are too long, ridiculous, and a waste of time. And because of that really poor experience, this is what's happening globally the world over. So this is talent board research. And what they're saying is 86% of candidates that have a bad experience say they wouldn't even remain a customer of that company again. But what I find really interesting is that 80% of those candidates say they wouldn't even reapply to the company if they were offered um, a future role. And the reason for this is really because of the legacy technology systems that we have in place today. So this is a Gartner study. Um, I know with the light it might be quite hard to see. But it's basically looking at um, research on thousands of different companies and the day in the life of every recruiter and looking what they have to do every minute and every hour of the day. So you can see there's a huge spike right up the top in candidate screening. And because of this, all this screening, constant rejection of candidates, they don't have any time, recruitment teams, to spend on, on doing anything else at all. So like, hands up in the room, just as a side um, digression, <coughs> hands up in the room if you feel within your recruitment team that you're continually being asked to do less with more. Okay, and hands up who is actually working for an organisation where they're actually giving you more budget and more team and more resources every year to do more. So think of the cotton trade, <laughs> for example, where every single year you're setting a new benchmark of really good performance and then the organisation is just asking you to shift your level of performance to that performance and not actually giving you more food to do what you just did. And this is really the reason, and legacy recruitment software really creates a game of rejection. And for that reason, what we start to term these things now, these applicant tracking systems, as Stan said in the main stage just earlier, is applicant rejection systems, because that's really what they're doing um, and making recruiters do to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people every year, is, is basically say, kiss my ass. Um, because as you, you probably heard from the main stage in there, for every one person you hire, you know, 99.5 people you're actually kind of giving the finger to and saying you're not good enough to kind of work for our organisation, but hey, come and buy a pair of jeans like the very next day. Josh Burson's got this really interesting quote um, where he says, the word experience has taken over the software market and for good reason. In today's digital world, if your experience isn't good, you just don't do business with a company. What I find interesting about this quote is we all know Josh Burson and how deep in the talent acquisition space he is, but he hasn't mentioned candidates or recruitment or anything once in this sentence. He's talking about just doing business um, with a company, but we all know exactly what he's saying um, from this quote. Today, we've all heard the term candidates are consumers like to the death, but if you think about it, like today, People change jobs every 1.8 years on average. They change jobs more than they change their phone plans. They change jobs more than they change their car. They change jobs often more times than they change their genes. So today candidates actually are more consumers than most consumer type products. And when we think about experience, <coughs> I think for me, like the best analogy is like an Uber. Like what, what is it about experience or customer experience or candidate experience? It's both the same today, it's the experience economy. And Uber now has more than three times the rides in San Francisco, for example. This is pretty much globally now compared to the entire taxi industry. Now, when you think about why that is, it's pretty simple. Like the big frustrations of taxis are they're dirty. Uh, you don't know when they're going to turn up and you have to pay with money at the end of the ride or your credit card while you're sitting on the curb and you just want to get out to your meeting and the, the, the ticket machine is just churning over and over and over. All Uber did was said, they're the three biggest frustrations, so we're going to make the cars clean, we're going to make it transparent so you know when they're arriving, and we're going to make you pay through the app. Now the interesting thing about this is the experience has really nothing to do with functionality. So if you think about it, a taxi's got four wheels, it's got a car, it's got a driving wheel, and it's got a driver. It's got all the same functionality, but the experience is very, very different. 
nine times out of 10, like I'm a founder of a technology company and nine times out of 10, when we go into a pitch against another technology firm to a recruitment team, nine times out of 10, it comes down to functionality. Can you do this one little function? Can you do this one little feature? And it's, it's, it's the completely wrong conversation to be having. You need to be thinking about what is the experience that this thing delivers? And really like when you go back to your jobs and you're looking at demonstrations and technology demos, just remember the Uber, Uber and the taxi analogy. They've got the exact same features and functionality, but the experience of these two systems is incredibly different. And that's really where you need to get your mindset going. And I think Eden made some really good comments in the main stage before about all his focus is on CX, CX, candidate experience, candidate experience. He doesn't care about KPIs. He doesn't care about SLAs or time to hire. It's what is the experience that's being driven for those candidates. <clears throat> the problem is though, like the current legacy systems are not able to really transform. Like think about a taxi. Uber's been around now for what, four or five years and taxis still haven't put waters in their car, they still haven't cleaned their cars, they still haven't changed the experience. It's very difficult to transform a traditional system into an experience type system and we see that happen the world over with disruption. Matt Charney's got a great quote, executive editor of Recruiter Daily, it's a tall order to transform a system of record into a system of engagement. So what does he mean by that? So the current recruitment software or applicant tracking systems or ASAs as we call them are, are systems of record and basically the first thing you either see is you, you might see a glossy career page or a CRM uh, like Bill Borman was just talking about a CRM should be your front end career page and should do a whole bunch of really glossy things but the problem is once you click, a, click apply you go straight to the applicant tracking system and we're talking Workday or Success Factors or Oracle Taleo or, or anything. Any software vendor that starts their technology demo with create a job requisition and post a job requisition, that's a legacy system. Because as soon as you do that, the only workflow or the experience for the candidate is to apply, be screened by a recruiter, be rejected and then repeat that process over and over and over again. There's a lot of CRMs in the market now that'll say, okay, after that person's applied, put them into a CRM and let's send email nurturing campaigns to them. But as you saw from that talent board research, four in five of those people never want to be spoken to again. And this is the problem with legacy systems and bolting CRMs onto an ATS system, is that you're building a dead database of people that do not give a shit about you anymore. They don't want to be spoken to, they don't want to buy any of your products, they don't, want to be, they don't want to hear from you, they certainly don't want your email spam. And I see this like right now in um, retail, we, we service a lot of really big high volume retail clients and leading up to Christmas and I just cringe all the time with these legacy systems where um, high volume retail people are recruiting you know, thousands of people, they're rejecting hundreds of thousands of people from their brand right before Christmas. And these hundreds of thousands of people are applying for these companies because they know their brand and they're probably planning on going to that shop to buy a present for their friend in a couple of weeks time. And I guarantee you they change their mind the minute they go through that experience and hear nothing and have a bad candidate experience. So there's a really big economic impact coming from this and it always reminds me at Christmas time every single year. What Matt Charney means by an experience, so you can't turn a system of record into a system um, a system of experience or a system of engagement. What he means by a system of engagement to begin with is where candidates can join your company's brand from anywhere across the internet or the open web. So today candidates are everywhere. They're not really on job boards anymore. They're sometimes on LinkedIn, but a lot of times they're coming through many, many different channels and they want to engage with your brand as simply as possible. They don't always want to search a career page, etc. They just want to let you know that they want to work for your brand and not for a specific role in particular. They just really want to work for your brand um, in most situations. When they join your talent community or you know, whatever you really want to call it, in, in the US they call it a private talent cloud. That seems to be the term that's really picking up and all the sources of talent across the internet they're calling the open talent cloud. So they're trying to bring candidates from the open cloud into a private cloud and give them the right experience. 
When they join, they get a text message on their phone to say, thanks for joining. Talent Board have shown now that simply communicating with people through SMS instead of email produces a 50% improvement in candidate experience instantly. So as a no-brainer, whatever technology you want to use, make sure it's communicating to people with SMS and not email. No one really checks email anymore today, or if they do, it's every several weeks and they're just kind of sifting through spam. The important thing about joining the community is whilst most CRMs will try and make it really quick and simple, they do that to the detriment of actually understanding the person. So most times if you've ever joined a talent community through a CRM, they'll ask you for your first name, last name, email address, uh, upload a CV and pick from a drop down list which industries or professions you're interested in. They don't really know anything about you from that point on. Think about a LinkedIn profile. So, a LinkedIn profile has 40 structured data points on me. I've got a fully completed LinkedIn profile and I'm still getting job alert suggestions to be store manager at McDonald's. Like how many of you have like in the past like looked at the LinkedIn job suggestions and kind of had a chuckle because you think that just doesn't match me at all. The point being if LinkedIn can't match you to the relevant jobs with 40 structured data points then there's no way in hell that a CRM that collects your first name, last name, email address and a drop down list of what industry you're interested in is going to be able to send you a relevant job alert um, email. So you need to be able to understand as much about these people as possible and to do that it's got to be very quick and simple and a very authentic connection. There's many good technologies that can parse data, can look into your CVs, scrape data, pre-populate for candidates, look across all your social profiles and pull data together. So make sure your software is very good at understanding as much as possible about someone in as very short a period of time. <coughs> the reason for understanding a lot about people is you need really good artificial intelligence, you need machine learning. Um, and really good algorithms to be able to sort people into very relevant roles in your organisation. Because if you think back to the Gartner study on the day in the life of a recruiter spending all their time screening, this is where artificial intelligence can really help you break the back of the process you're doing so you can start to focus on really where the key elements of candidate experience are. And so with a lot of information on people, artificial intelligence can sort people into talent pools and it can suggest people like friend suggestions on Facebook and as a recruiter you can accept or reject those suggestions and then machine learning can start to learn and get better and better and better with those suggestions and free up all, those time, all that time for you. When they get put into talent pools, again you automate and send them another text message to say hey just letting you know I've popped you into the marketing manager talent pool, let me know if you have any questions and they can text back through text message and I guarantee you it blows their mind in terms of the experience that that delivers to them. <clears throat> so what happens when you kiss your ass goodbye and you actually change, um, change your system? Now we, we're starting to term, coin the terminology ass as in an applicant tracking system and we're helping companies transform into an ass, which is an AWS, which we're calling an applicant satisfaction system. And we all know it's much nicer to look at an ass as it is to look at an ass, okay? So just remember that little kind of ditty in your head. <coughs> so this, is, this data I'm about to show you is looking across almost 100 companies, across 14 of the 18 biggest industries in Australia, about half a million applications, and the last 9,000 hires across all of those organisations. So this is straight up you can see your time to hire is more than halved. And again, I agree um, with Eden that time to hire is not actually that important. What is important about time to hire though is the longer you take to hire someone, the more likely they are to drop out of the process because another company is going to hire them. So that is singularly the only important thing about time to hire is if you think they're the right person, you want to get an offer to them as quickly as possible. Everything else really doesn't matter. You've got to understand that person as much as you can. This is where it gets really interesting though. So this is the quality of the shortlist. So what this data is showing us is how many people do you need to put on a shortlist in order to satisfy the hiring manager that, that one of those people is right to hire. So this is a system of engagement first. You can see that you only need three people on a shortlist from the AI suggested matches in order to guarantee the hiring manager is going to be happy. 
Look at the traditional legacy systems and systems of record from career website to job boards to social media. Companies right across Australia are having to stack from eight to 15 people on a short list just to satisfy the hiring manager. So again, think about the amount of interview time, reference checking time, psychometric testing that you're doing, uh, hiring manager, you know, technical testing, etc. You're talking like a four to five fold increase in work um, just to get the hire. This third um, data point looks at what we call candidate retention. So what it's telling us is for a particular role, how many people can you hire for that role before one person withdraws from the recruitment process really late in the stage when you put a lot of energy into that person. We all understand how frustrating it is often when someone gets the offer letter out, they're a great candidate and they withdraw or even they might sign the offer letter and t just not turn up on the day. So what you can see is with a system of engagement first and building really authentic relationships, you can hire six people for every role before one person drops away. And if you look at the traditional systems of record, which create really inauthentic candidate experiences, you're literally having to hire one person, one to two people for every single time one person that you wanted to hire withdraws at the last minute. So this is, I think, probably the most powerful um, outcome of a really good candidate experience is actually being able to get the best talent that you want uh, as quickly as you can. And Gartner have actually released some really interesting research just this year which directly correlates candidate retention to employee retention. So what Gartner have proven now is literally for every improvement, percentage improvement in candidate retention during recruitment directly translates to employee retention within the business. So if, if one of your, your company's issues is retention of staff, then having the right candidate experience at the front end will literally translate into better employee retention. And then when you roll all of that time up, so when you think about the hiring manager's time, the recruiter's time, and the time to source candidates, uh, and you factor all that, that in as a cost, that's, that is the cost to hire each of those candidates across those 100 odd companies and 14 industries. So with this system of engagement, you're looking at around $2,500 a hire. Through the traditional systems of record, you're looking at upwards of $5,500 per hire. The thing with this though is like, like we can talk till the cows come home about reducing cost to hire. But as I was saying like back in the beginning with the slave trade, if you reduce cost to hire, you're just going to end up with a smaller budget <laughs> next year to do your recruitment. So I know that cost to hire really doesn't matter anything in this room. Like it's, it's really not that important. What I want to help this room do is advocate for bigger budgets and, and more relevancy um, and more strategic power and relevancy within the business. So I think this next slide is probably the most interesting of the talk and I think this is where you can get, get your superpower from today's talk. <coughs> so this is Zoom Media again. You can again see all their followers compared to how many candidates they've got in their talent community. But what's really interesting is to look at their engagement stats. Instagram, 1.92% engagement when they send out posts across those followers. Facebook, 0.12% engagement across 8,500 followers. This is what the marketing team are doing day in, day out, with probably four times the budget of the recruitment team. LinkedIn, 0.26% engagement across 19,000 followers. These are the cost per click that it's costing the recruitment team. So $3.50 for every click on that engagement, a dollar on Facebook, $5.20 for every single click on LinkedIn. It costs, just as a, a point of note, it costs about four times that much just to get a follow-up on these social media platforms. So this is the money that marketing and sales are pouring into this level of engagement. Whereas at the opposite end of the business, because Zoom Media have an ass, they don't have an ass. They've got 24,200 followers and 36% engagement. So when they send a text message to that talent community, 36% of people are responding within 24 hours. These people are all potential customers. These people are all potential buyers. They're all potential advocates of Media in the same way that people on LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram following these people are as well. So what I'd like you to take away from this talk today 
is, is to think about the power that you have as a recruitment. How many applicants are you getting into your business every single year? It's a pretty easy one to work out compared to how many followers you have within your business across all those social media platforms. And I guarantee nine out of 10 people in this room, you'll probably have more people, more applicants every year into your business than what the entire social media following of your company is. Find out what budget that your marketing and sales team have, and then go and have a conversation with marketing and say, what is it worth to you to actually turn these tens or hundreds of thousands of people into into advocates for your brand. I mean, the simplest thing you can do is ask them to follow your social media platforms uh, when they apply for a job with you. But really, I think the key, the key concept from today is that you guys and girls are the most powerful people, I think, in, in the business. In terms of a customer awareness engine, you have like what's most important. You have, you have what's most important to people after food, water and shelter. You have a job. You have someone's opportunity for identity, for self-worth, for meaning, for purpose in their life. You have this magnet that is bringing people to your organisation. So I'd say engage your marketing team and start treating your candidates like customers. Really look at investing in a candidate experience platform. Transform what you're doing and kiss your ass goodbye and start leveraging your ass and send brand advocates directly to your marketing team and start growing your marketing budget. Thanks very much. Okay, Dr. Mike, that's great. Um, I think we've got time for one or two questions. Anyone have a question? So the question was around GDPR and, and if you're working in a global organisation, like what, what you can and can't ask people. Um, the principles around GDPR is that whatever the data the candidate puts into their profile they own and that they can erase um, and change at any point in time. So really, provided you are working within the privacy laws of, of the country, so you might not be able to ask about their gender um, or their pay rates in the US, for example, um, there's an enormous amount of information you still have on people, but the point is that they need to be able to own their own data and, and, and erase it and change it if they want to. But other than that, like as long as you're abiding by the terms and conditions of the, the country, you're fine. Yeah. Okay, I just had one question for you, because I'm looking at the looking at the presentation, thinking about yeah. stuff. Um, what part of this is actually a community? Because I couldn't see a community aspect to it. <coughs> Yeah, it depends on the terminology of a community. So a lot of a lot of people's sense terms of a community is where people can talk to each other. Um, that's why in the US that a lot are changing the terminology to a private talent cloud because community is probably more about how people network and talk to each other. Um, so it's yeah, it's more just a terminology thing. I personally don't think talent community is the right word for it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks so much.